Um, hello, I'm Alaric King. Uh, I work for the Crown Commercial Service and I had to rewrite my presentation last week, so I'm going to stick closely here and read my notes a little bit. Um, and it's a bit of a personal story. Um, it's using design systems and how restriction in design can help us build better products. So, I'm a senior interaction designer. Um, anyone know what an interaction designer is? Okay, we've got a couple. Good. <laughs> Uh, and the Crown Commercial Service helps the UK public sector save money when buying common goods and services. And that's called procurement, for anyone who wants a more familiar term. Um, and that could be um, buying anything from the Department of Education wanting to buy some supply teachers, all the way through to a local authority wanting to buy police cars. Uh, we also sell kind of chemical hazard suits as well. Well, not sell, but we broker them. It's, it's a random array of things that you can buy through us. So before working in government, um, I worked in the creative industry as a visual designer and producing all kinds of websites like this. Um, you'll notice the priority here is kind of high impact visuals. Um, it's kind of imagery creating captivating uh, bits and pieces like that. Um, a lot of agonizing over fonts, creative direction of photos, uh, and having generally lots of arguments with people. And the general mantra of this industry is if it's existed before, we cannot use it. Everything has to be original. So then when I came to government, I started using the GovUK design system. That, 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 that. You'll see what my first few weeks were like. So who here knows what a design system is? Okay, for those who don't, it's documentation and guidance on how things should look and work. And so in this context, a user interface. Um, and it's where basic interactions have already been solved and design, design decisions have already been made. And they're super granular, right? Everything has been covered. So from buttons, how they look, when to use them. There's even a section on when not to use a button on the GovUK design system. And even code examples as well, over here, to make sure that everything you're doing is accessible. WCAG 2.1 AA compliant, for those who are real accessibility nerds like me. And that's to make sure they work across assistive technology. Um, and we go all the way through to page layouts. So we've got headers, footers, we've got column layouts, we've got uh, typography, grids, and things like that. It's pretty comprehensive. And that's generally the reaction of most designers when they come across a really, really comprehensive design system. <laughs> Uh, that was me. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't wearing a panda suit. Otherwise, my colleagues would have found it a bit more entertaining than they did. Uh, a general thing, you can't commoditize design. Don't give me rules and restrictions. I can't work with this straight jacket. All of my toys in the box, throwing them everywhere. Um, and I think a lot of it comes from a, a, a kind of a deep feeling that it's a threat to a career of a designer. If you're telling me how to do everything, am I just doing paint by numbers? Do you, paint by numbers is the thing where you have all the numbers on the painting and you just, you're just following it. it it's, it's, you see it as a tedious threat. So let's go on a little journey um, and see how that can change. So for the sake of this demonstration, don't you dare photograph this. Because if this goes out and you find that the UK government is building services to sell squirrels, I will get fired. Um, <laughs> We're going to use an exotic... Oh, I can see this already. Um, <laughs> we're going to build something that lets civil servants, so members of government or local authority, buy a squirrel. And we're going to play out two scenarios of how that could work inside organisations. Organisation one, with no design system. Who's ready? There we go. So, lack of design restriction. <laughs> In four weeks... Four weeks, how many workshops can you run inside four weeks inside a large organisation? Quite a lot. So let's say four weeks and five workshops. We've got three concepts. Uh, designers have helped this drift happen. Um, the drift in design artefacts starts the drift in conversations, starts the drift in opinions from stakeholders, which starts the drift in product. Now, oh, it's not working. Woo, what have I done? This, for anyone who's worked in a startup, will feel very familiar. So I've worked in quite a few startups, and it's amazing how you can start with this by the beginning of a workshop. And by the end of the workshop, everyone, including the account manager, has decided you need to sell something totally different. 
Um, a lot of these things, a lot of the scenarios where this generally tends to happen, from my experience of just under a decade of being a designer, generally it's the highest paid person in the room who chooses the design at this point. Um, and they normally go for this one up here, because it says tech, it says future, it's cliche, uh, it's safe. And this is what happens when an organisation with a design system. So, having a design system, don't laugh, <laughs> having a design system takes us back to where we should have been to begin with. We're actually testing what's important. And so within a couple of hours, we can create an artifact like this. We can put it in front of users. And from a brief round of testing, we realize the content isn't performing well. Anyone read Latin? No, probably not. Well, you might do. <coughs> and so we change. Our content designs work on it, and we come up with some terminology with simple phrasing, and we test it, and we find that novice buyers can now use it. They can get through this page. That's amazing. Uh, though some expert buyers have said, you're missing a whole load of information here that's really important. Like, seriously, it's really that simple? Don't patronize me. I buy squirrels for a living. <laughs> so we start to play around, and we, we come up with variations, and we look at what we can do with our content designers. We start to, we start to satisfy some expert buyers. We have a simple description. And we keep the novice buyers relatively happy. And I appreciate users cannot be split in between expert and novice. There is gray everywhere in everything. Um, including my trousers. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, I appreciate it. It's not always black and white. And so we start looking at other things. Maybe progressive disclosure is needed. Where's the cognitive overload on this page? How much information do we need to give our users? Um, and as an interaction designer, that's, that's where I'm valuable, right? It's actually using techniques and patterns to fine-tune things that actually matter, not coming up with how are we going to use stock photography to get this past the stakeholder so he can give us enough round of funding so we can make sure we're actually developing the thing that's important, all that sort of stuff. We also look at exposing complexity earlier on the journey. How does this test? What happens if we give people documentation to read? If anyone has done procurement before, it's really documentation heavy. Um, and this is what we start to play with. And all of this is achievable in a really short period of time, and we're talking a matter of weeks. And all the while, we've bypassed a lot of meetings. We've bypassed those dreaded internal workshops. We've bypassed arguments about corporate messaging and direction as well, which are important, but probably not when you're trying to build something that's actually quite important like this. Admittedly, squirrels may not be what you need. Um, and with the basic design principle solved, we, as designers, we have the time and energy to look at other parts of the service. It's actually encouraging lateral thinking um, and kind of encouraging pain. So this is a kind of like a pain chart, which I bodged together the other night. Um, lighter areas are kind of less painful, darker areas are, let's say, more painful. We're going everything from the identification that I need the squirrel, <laughs> all the way through to me having the squirrel. Um, you'll notice the key down there, no pain, lots of pain. You could change user pain with units of alcohol required. <laughs> Procurement is horrible, <laughs> it's tough and you normally need a lot of alcohol to get through it. And we realize as designers that the digital interaction we're doing is tiny. Like this is a small, small piece of a very difficult, turbulent journey for our users. It's not just about the interface. Um, and so we have as designers at this point the capacity to be responsible, not just for buttons or type sizes. Now that's really, it sounds really simple, but it's, it's hugely profound. You're an interaction designer, but you suddenly become responsible for everything else. And that's a really interesting shift because it lets you look at things like this. So you make observations and you start thinking, oh, hang on, isn't it interesting that the exposure to long-form com content, legal documentation, and that sort of stuff, or regulation, happens exactly where the difficult parts of the journey were? Oh yeah, there's that there, but actually, there's all this pain everywhere else. And that is, uh, that's really interesting. And we can, um, from that, I think we now have the insight that the bad performance of the interface could have its roots in a much more challenging service level need. We stop just thinking about that interface and we, we open up this problem to everyone else as well. And also, ironically, the design system that I was worried about, I mean, not me, no, I was never worried about the design system. Um, it makes us more valuable as a designer because we start to cross over user research, we start to cross over into service design, 
and we start to adjust our perspective to see the same problem is actually part of a much wider ecosystem as well. And with that comes the encouragement to start having conversations with people in government who wrote the documentation about squirrels. <laughs> they do exist. Um, and also we start to have conversations with people who understand the regulations behind it as well. And we've been started engaging in rich internal discussions. That is not a phrase you often hear. If you, yeah, rich internal discussions are genuinely what this stuff, you, you start realizing you need to have these to solve the problems. It's also, those discussions are, I think, from my experience, the best place to also sell user-centered design within your organization, within your authority, because that's actually where you can start saying, hey, this actually saves money. There's a load of benefits in this, beyond me just irritating you every 10 minutes with questions. Um, and so design systems have gone from being a straitjacket to an enabler. They've helped us focus on what's important really quickly. They've saved us a ton of money and time. And they've also set a minimum standard of the quality of the things we're producing as well. They also allow us to proactively shift the application of our skills to where they're needed most. And that sometimes is helping sub-disciplines within a team work together. Um, but where I think the most value lies in design systems is actually that they give us the time and space to have those difficult conversations with users and business. And I think, and I don't know about you, keen to hear, I think that's the hardest part and the most critical part of any project is that bit in the middle in between other stuff. It's, if you've ever fitted a bathroom before, it's the silicon around the cracks. That to me is always where everything goes wrong. Uh, so there you go, design systems. Thank you.